Not only is it Cowboys week, it is playoffs for the 49ers, but it's poaching season as well. 49ers assistants being interviewed for head coach jobs, for GM jobs around the league. And we've got some audio from Kyle Shanahan's conference call today talking about those Dallas Cowboys. All that coming up and more on this Wednesday episode of Locked On 49ers. You are Locked On 49ers, your daily San Francisco 49ers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On 49ers Wednesday edition. You know what that means. Another winky Wednesday. Today's guest, Nick Winkler, will be joining us momentarily. Brian Peacock and Eric Crocker at BD Peacock at Eric underscore Crocker. Let's get into this and let's bring on today's guest. Nicholas Winkler, come on down. Wow. Wink. What's happening, my man? How you feeling? You, you got a little extra uh, hop Whew. in your step after uh, that 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 scintillating finale to the 2021 regular season. Those 49ers made it there in the playoffs. I mean, it's just so wild, right? Because it felt over. It was like, oh, God, when you gave the ball back. And it's like, are, are we ever going to see the ball again? Like, I think it's done. My wife's like, is everything okay? I was like, no, everything is not okay. <laughs> it's not facing around the house. So how about this? Uh, according to Next Gen Stats, the 49ers had the lowest minimum win probability of any team to eventually win a game in the Next Gen <laughs> Stat era, including wow. the famous Miami Miracle in Super Bowl 51, which was 28 to 3. Like, this was that epic of a comeback win yeah. for the 49ers. And the low point wasn't even 17 nothing. It was actually later in the game, it was. Uh, the 49ers had a 0.4% chance to win. It was at the moment that. Wow. Uh, Probably the sack for fourth and 18. Yep. That sounds yes, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I just went like this when that happened. Just like sat there for a couple minutes. So, so really there was like two. Mm. There was like two comebacks. Yeah. So um, after punting with 157 left remaining in the game, that was. Yeah. So basically, in order for the 49ers to come back and win, they had to force a three and out, score a touchdown without any timeouts, prevent the Rams from scoring in regulation, and then go win in overtime. Or and let's are not you forget to real quick I mean, something you guys it was it was harder for them to win from that point than it even was for them to come back in the second quarter from 17 nothing because at least they had time to do that. They had, yeah. they had little time to screw around once it got to that point. You know, it's crazy because like you guys mentioned it, you know, on the rapid react, how clutch. Kyle Juszczyk was in that game because yeah, they scored that touchdown, but they still needed to kick an extra point and he needed to hold that ball. Like that's not his job. He he does it. Yeah. He's the backup, but I was like, it's not, it's not tied yet. It's not tied yet. Like this is a big, big kick. And then he had to do it again in overtime too. So I'm just, I'm going to give juice even more love. Were you guys surprised that McVay decided to just run the ball three straight times and make the final use the timeouts sure. as opposed to be a little bit more aggressive and throw the ball, which they, you know, at obviously the second half, they didn't have as much success throwing. But I was just so shocked that he just gave up because the run game was not working at no, all. all the run game was getting stuffed for the majority of the game. They had like two runs that were worth a damn. So and you got Cooper down. Cup who's setting records. Right. And with the 49ers, when they had all three timeouts to me. I feel like your whole playbook is open. Now, if the 49ers had two timeouts, you have right. three downs and you want to run some of the clock. Right, I get it. But all three timeouts, you have three plays and you just give up like that. I thought that was mm. odd, especially for a coach who seems to be a little bit more on the aggressive side. Yeah, I thought it was surprising with that. And I thought it was surprising in the opposite way when Kyle Shanahan started throwing the ball again after yeah. they went 10 straight runs. And then the next drive, and then I thought he went it was empty backfield. Same. They went empty backfield. Yeah. Kyle went empty backfield, not even the threat of a run on that second and 14 play. That, that, that one shocked me. That was probably Damn. his worst play call of the game. And it ended up in an interception too. It took a fantastic play by, um, by Jalen Ramsey for that to happen. But still there, there was some shocking stuff that happened in that game. There was no, I mean, that was, <laughs> I don't know if you saw this week, but, 
uh, one of the one of our listeners sent us, and I don't I don't have it saved. I wish I did, but shout out to whoever it was sent us their the screen capture from their Fitbit or their Apple Watch or whatever it was that showed their heart rate during the game. It was like it was in like, <laughs> it was in like red territory at that. Yeah, point. Yeah, I, I don't even want to know oh, where no, I was at. It. You could see oh. it going up and down. But at that point, and you could tell where it was in the game. I mean, it's like red. I'm like, wow, yeah. I never thought to do that. <laughs> it made the win so much sweeter, you know, that it felt like it was over. It did. Yeah, it oh, absolutely man. did. Um, how about this, though? It, we, we, there's a lot of folks that get interviewed, and Adam Peters has been interviewed before. Mm -hmm. but there's potential and the 49ers are a playoff team when you're a pretty good team, when you have a good offense, when you have something special about your team. And I think um, you, I think there's multiple things on the 49ers that you can look at. You can say, I want to get a piece of that front office. I want to get a piece of that offense. I want to get a piece of that defense. And, uh, and I think we might see all of those. I haven't seen yet any official teams requesting to interview D'Amico Ryans. I think that is absolutely going to happen, uh, whether mm -hmm. it's you know, this offseason or maybe you know he's a year or two from that. And I think Kyle Shanahan was right on when he said, and he reiterated today in his conference call, that, yeah, the D'Amico Ryans is going to be head coach, and I have no reason to doubt that. And I think he'll knock interviews out of the park, too. So that's why you kind of hope, as a 49ers fan, that he's not getting those interviews right, right now. But I'm a little bit surprised that the 49ers offensive coordinator Mike McDaniel, he's a smart guy, but he's not head coach material to me. Like, is that like not necessarily him as a human being, but I think just right now you hear him talk with the media and he's a smart guy, but he's only had one year. He's kind of been, yeah. um, you know, he's been a run game coordinator. And I know the 49ers have a great running game, but you're, you're going to make him a head coach. That one was a little surprising. I thought we'd hear D'Amico Ryan's name way before we heard, sure. um, before we heard Mike McDaniel's name. But obviously, you know, there's been other, offensive coordinators from the Kyle Shanahan tree to get other jobs. But that one was a little bit there. surprising to me. Croc, that surprised you a little bit? It, it's the it, it's the coaching tree, you know, just coming from that offense. And people love it. And you look at some of the success that these guys are having around the league right now, whether it's LaFleur, uh, Zach Taylor over in Cincinnati yeah. and the job he's done there. You know, there's all those kind of Shanahan, McVay, Minions running around right now. And they're getting jobs. And they are they, – they're doing well. I think the one that kind of filled the most was uh, who, was it Mc, who who went to the Broncos to be an officer coordinator. I mean, he wasn't the head coach, but he went to be an uh, OC. Uh, and I thought that was this year. Somebody this went, was not uh, like last ago. year. Yeah, was it scaring scaring Gorillo? Did he oh, was yes, he ever? That's right. So Scangarello went from quarterbacks coach with the 49ers to offensive coordinator. Yeah, and, then, and like, it did not work. It was, work. It was like one nah. and one. And then yeah. came back to the Niners. Yeah, but aside from right. me, I mean, it feels like everybody else has had some level of success. Obviously, right. you have McDaniels, I believe, over there in New York right now. And I mean, you, you know, we all know what that situation is. Uh, but in, in New England, you mean Josh McDaniels? No, no, Mike Mike McDaniel. Oh, you mean of LaFleur? LaFleur Who's over? Yes. Who does Sala take with him? Sala took LaFleur. He took, he took. Oh. I thought the, the other Mike, the Mike McDaniel, still with the Niners. Mike Lafleur, the other Mike of the two Mikes, okay. pairing. Uh, he went to New York, and then his brother Matt is in Green Bay. As right, I'm team. confused with all these guys. Yeah, now, it confuses me too. And I always, yeah. every time I say either one of the Mikes or Matt Lafleur, I stop and pause and think, okay, is it Mike or is it Matt? Like, which one am I talking about right now? It's Matt in <laughs> Green Bay. It's Mike Lafleur in New York. Mike McDaniel in San Francisco. I think those guys are going to continue man. to get opportunities just because of where they're coming from. I mean, I don't want to say continue, but they will get an opportunity at some point because of the tree that they're coming from. Yeah. Right. No, uh, I, I don't doubt that at all. Wink, I know you're stinking on something. We don't have time right this second to get into that. But uh, but Wink is, is stinking on something from Sunday, I think. So we're going to mm -hmm. check in on Wink, even though the 49ers won. And um, there is some front office interviews some more potential poaches that I think are maybe even more likely than the coaching poaches in this cycle, potentially to leave the San Francisco 49ers more on that next, some audio from Kyle Shanahan talking about Debo Samuel and those Dallas Cowboys. But how about built bar? It's the new year. You're trying to have those new year's resolutions. We're, you know, in week two of the new year and maybe those resolutions starting to get a little bit more difficult, but you know what makes it a lot easier is Built Bars because they are covered in 100% chocolate. They are delicious. They are a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. 
uh, you want to eat healthy, but sometimes it gets boring. But by, you know, week two, week three, it's just not worth it. But it is with Built Bar, and you won't feel like you're missing anything at all. It's so much easier to stick to your resolution because it takes You'll want to eat it unlike other protein bars that can be chalky or waxy or uh, in some cases tastes like a chemical spill. You know what I'm talking about if you try a lot of different kinds of protein bars. Most Built Bars contain only 130 calories, only 3 grams of sugar, only 4 grams of net carbs, and 17 grams of protein to power you through your day. Compare that to a candy bar that you might be reaching for that's 240 calories and 30 grams of sugar. That will absolutely wreck your diet so go to builds.com use promo code lock 15 for 15 percent off your order that is promo code locked 15 for 15 percent off at built.com tell me if i'm wrong guys but i feel like now that his name has gone been out there for a couple of cycles that he's interviewed more as i feel like the first interview is never the job you get unless you're just a superstar right uh you're a superstar up and comer 49ers assistant GM, and he already got a bump in salary, a bump in title recently. He's now assistant GM to John Lynch. Adam Peters is going to be interviewing with the New York Giants in their GM search, according to Peter Schrager of NFL Network. And another member of the 49ers front office also interviewed by the same team, which is interesting. So the Giants have a keen eye on the San Francisco Hmm. 49ers organization right now. Uh, Director of player personnel right under Adam Peters, Rand Carthen is another person that is uh, up for that Giants GM job. What do you think? Adam Peters, Rand Carthen, um, Mike McDaniel, D'Amico Ryans, uh, any, all, do you think they're leaving? Which one would hurt the most, Wink, if they did leave in, uh, in this cycle? I think Peters does a lot more than, than we really know about up there, you know, as assistant general manager. I think that one would probably hurt the most. You know, I, I think that he has a lot to do with player personnel, which, you know, hasn't been perfect, obviously, but nothing is. And, you know, if you're a team like the Giants and you're dumpster fire, you know, since benching Eli Manning, like you're going to go after a team that hasn't been a dumpster fire and has actually been very successful. So it makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, you don't want to lose any of those guys, but I think he'd hurt the most. Rock, what do you think? You worried about the coaching staff more or the front office? I think all coaching staff, because when I look at the 49ers, I, I feel like they have like a superior coaching staff to a lot of the teams around the NFL in the sense of X's and O's and executing. You know, Kyle Shanahan gets a lot of credit, but what D'Amico Ryans has been able to do with oh, yeah. all the turnover in, I mean, just the injuries to secondaries, figuring out different ways to kind of cover guys up to the point where I believe the 49ers have the number three defense in the NFL. Like, how Crazy. is that even possible? So you don't want to lose guys like that. I think that's the one guy. I, I don't think that's just plug and play to have a guy be able to get the response that he has from his defense the way he has. Don't want him going. Anybody else, I mean, Adam Peters and, you know, whatever. But I think Rand Carthen, I, I did hear or see someone on social media vouch for him and say whoever lands him, they are landing a high-level guy. So, and I'm like, who is he? 49ers have who? What? <laughs> so I didn't know who he was, but maybe he's somebody the 49ers don't want to lose, or if they do lose Peters, he's someone that can kind of step up and do, ha- take on a little bit more responsibility. But D'Amico Ryans, please don't go. Rand right. Carthen played for the New York Giants too. Maybe that's the extra bit of mm. connection, didn't he? Or was that the other Carthen? No, he played for some teams. I, I looked it up. He played f- about four or five years in the NFL before. Make a lot a of sense. Uh, I'm looking it up now. So Colts, he played. Looks like he only played for the Colts, 2005 and 2006. So younger. There guy. was another team in preseason or like or a practice squad or something, right? I think it was hmm. maybe was it his brother Maurice Carthen? Oh no! Oh, there's his dad. Oh my God! So that does make me feel. Wow. Maurice Carthon is Rand Carthon's dad, and I think he played. I think he was like fullback for the New York Giants. Let me double check on that one. I don't know. It's being slow to load. Yeah, there we go. New York Giants running back, fullback, Maurice Carthen from 1985 to 1992. Wow. And you remember that. Brother, it was his dad. Wow. And you remember that. Maurice, I don't know. I don't know why. uh, Tech Mobile, dude. Yeah, that's the one. That's exactly why. It has to be. Um, Very interesting. So... Uh, it's it's really hard with the front office to know exactly what they're doing, like who liked yeah. which guys, you know? So like you go you go interview them, right? It's like, okay, who was all about Kittle and who was all about whoever <laughs> else, you know, CJ Beathard or 
uh, Jalen Hurd. You know, like whatever you think was a bad draft pick, whatever you think was a good draft pick. Like talk, whoever talk, the good guys were. That, know, that was, that was yeah. that's the interview I wish I was in the room for because those yeah. are the answers I want too. You know, I would yeah. love to hear about all that stuff. And and they might not be able to say everything because if you don't get hired, you want you don't want people to know what your draft board looked like necessarily. But I'd be asking all about the the draft this year. What was the thought process mm-hmm. moving up? After the quarterback, um, you know, what would be your plan with the New York Giants? All those things that would be super fascinating to me, but it's really hard to know what roles all these guys have. Uh, if it would be a huge loss, you know, is it because John Lynch has been around for a while and John Lynch is on top, and it's the same with Kyle Shanahan. It's like, is the Kyle Shanahan offense going to suck because he loses his former run game coordinator, his offense coordinator? I feel like Mac- Mike McDaniel is the least of the worries I, uh, out of all of them. I think right now, D'Amico Ryan's would be the one that I would want to lose the least out of everybody mm-hmm. that might be getting interviews and potentially being hired in the next couple cycles. Even more than Adam Peters. And I probably would have not said Adam Peters. I probably would have said Adam Peters last year at this time. Um, I, it's just really hard to know. And at this point, yeah. John Lynch has done the job enough yeah. now that he's trained on the job and he's in charge anyway. So I, I don't know how much. And it's probably why you would if you're Adam Peters or you're Rand Carthen, why you would take the job. Because like, look, I'm not, I don't get final say. I, if you're going to give me final say and a bump and pay, bring it on. Let's go. But, I mean, that would be especially if he's making all those decisions, right? right. Yeah. Do we well, do we put too much on like GMs and how good or bad they are when we have Brian Peacock with a shallow draft that's just as good as an NFL? <laughs> uh, you know, it's his, his shallow draft is good as any. I so, like so it. I mean, if if Peacock can do it from his music room. How important is it as a GM? And I'm not saying that there's not GMs that might be better or whatever, but I really think the biggest thing is finding the quarterback. If you find the quarterback, then everybody's good. Yeah, everybody plays up, right? Coach quarterback, you have that marriage. You can lose all the assistants. You can lose your star defensive lineman. You can lose people from your front office. You can lose assistants. It doesn't matter if you've got that and you can like replenish and you've got to be able to draft okay. I, I mean, I will say it. For 20 years, it was awesome. But then there was multiple bad drafts in a row by the Patriots, and the thing did start to crumble a little bit. So it's not nothing, but it is – there's no – it's not as stark as the difference in, you know, like the best GM in the league and the worst GM in the league. It's not right. as as stark as the difference between the best quarterback in the league and the best – and the worst quarterback in the league because right. one you can't win with the other. It's like uh, you got fifty four percent of your picks right instead of forty nine percent of your picks right. Like, it's like it seems like they miss on half their picks no matter who's making the picks. Eventually, exactly. you know, in, in the long term, it's crazy how hard it is to consistently pick good players in the NFL. And, and that's I mean, why I like that you do the shadow draft because that puts into yeah. perspective with like, hey, like I I do this. I watch. You know, I don't even know if you have all the access to all 22. So a lot of it is your, your YouTube scouting and still finding the prospects that you feel would be best suited for the 49ers. You're not able to go and talk to these people in person. You're not able to talk to their coaches, but somehow you still pick the right guy. So I, I don't want to diminish their role and their abilities to build teams, but if Peacock can do it from his house, then I, I don't want to lose D'Amico Ryan's who's coaching. I think he makes – a bigger difference than but on, Adam Peters or anybody else you could lose. I mean, on that note, a year ago, we're, we're if we were asked the same question, we'd be saying, Robert Sala, we can't lose Robert Sala. Look what he did with this defense. Robert Sala, Robert Sala. And here we are a year removed, and it's D'Amico Ryan. So is, is that just a plug-and-play thing? Uh, I, I, think the foul, right? the, I think the 49ers, looking back, were lucky that they had D'Amico Ryan's ready to go, and that's why they didn't panic and they didn't really even worry about bringing in outside people because they knew they had this star player. Kyle Shanahan today said that um, he knew that he knew that that D'Amico Ryans was going to be a head coach when he was a player, when Kyle Shanahan was an assistant and D'Amico was still a player. And so that's how like impressive of a guy he was. And, yeah. and that's why he hired him right away um, and to like quality control or whatever, then, you know, end up linebackers and then now defensive coordinator. And I wasn't uh, worried about losing Salah. I don't know why, but well, I, I was. wasn't I, like it didn't. What a leader he like, was! I, I feel like we weren't going to be in as dire a need of of like this, like as if we went now. Like I feel like if you lose mm-hmm. D'Amico Ryan's, you're starting all the way over. But when the Robert Sala conversation started popping up, everybody was like D'Amico Ryan's, D'Amico Ryan's, or uh, Chris Eric. Like there were just these names that I was comfortable with, not knowing how well they were going to do. But I was high on the possibility of D'Amico Ryan's doing well. 
because of his background. Not, I mean, the linebackers, I understand they, they're the kind of the quarterbacks of the team. I mean, you have the safeties, but the linebackers, sure. they have to know the front end, they have to know the back end. Yeah, there's something to actually doing it and being in it. Uh, there's something to understanding the dynamics of a locker room and being a part of, of it course. for so many years, being team captains. He was all of those things. And then he had been in every single meeting. He's been with the 49ers the whole time that this entire staff had got there. So him being a part of all of that, a part of every meeting, being a linebacker, as well as Robert Sala and his background coaching linebackers, I just thought it was something that was just going to work out. And <laughs> I mean, obviously <laughs> it it's not to this extent being a, a, a top five defense, but just in the right. sense of, hey, I, you know, I, I think it's going to do well. And right away, I saw that his schemes and his game plans, I thought they were good the entire time. Outside of two games, one, the Cardinals game, I felt like he had no clue on what to do with Colt McCoy. And then the other time it was Justin Fields, where I think he maybe miscalculated how well his pass rush was going to do against Fields. But outside of that, I thought as mm -hmm. far as what he was thinking, I could see what a coach is thinking by watching the game plan. I thought he's been pretty good. No, agree. Two things. One, I knew how good of a coach D'Amico Ryans was, and I wasn't super worried because he had that like 99 Madden awareness back in the day. So I was like, okay, Niners going to be good there. And two, <laughs> the reason that it's so hard to find a good GM is because they're looking at all the wrong places. They need to go to more uh, basements, right? And they need to go really? to more podcasts <laughs> and figure out where the real smart folks are, right. where, where the real genius is, and, uh, and, and go higher from there. We can do it, Peacock. Peacock, we can I do it. Agreed. The reason, the reason, dude, dude, me and you, Croc, like, honestly, there's a few other folks uh, on, you know, draft Twitter, writers, podcasters, whatever. No doubt in my mind, we could put together a, a scouting staff, a staff that would wreck certain teams in the NFL. I'm not saying we're going to go, you know, we go build a dynasty or whatever, but there's bad front office. We could go toe to toe. We could go toe to toe with any. Absolutely. You could put yeah. together a staff that could go toe to toe, literally, with any staff in the NFL. And I yes. strongly believe that. Now, some of it is about relationships, but clearly, Peacock doesn't even need relationships. He has a shadow draft, and it's just as good as the, the, the teams. I mean, yeah. come on. And, and mm -hmm. when I see the shadow draft, I see a draft that's better than the 49ers for the last 10 years. So I think i got to retire it. It's been 10 years. I don't know if I want to do it anymore. I feel like I was <laughs> right on top. That. that was 10 years, a decade. Yeah. I beat the Niners. Let's go. Um, Your Barry but, Sanders. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A Barry Sanders-like career. Uh, it, but it's I, is there an over analysis? Do they have too much information? Because yeah. when I look at the shadow drafts, I'm like, God, I missed on all these players. But I was really good on the players I had the most information about in the earlier rounds. I was less good in the later rounds where the 49ers have been good in the later rounds, worse in the earlier rounds. Is there something about like an over analysis that happens with teams and like an analysis paralysis where they get too much information? Because something's definitely going on. These teams shouldn't be missing as often as they do on first round draft picks. Good That's question. Great point. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know if there's an answer to that. I, I have no right. idea. But um, we'll see. We'll see if any of those 49ers are real quick iron away. Go ahead. So my 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 big cousin, you know, we all play Madden. You know, we built our teams. He loves like the figuring that part out, right? He's a former player. He was with the Chargers with like Ladanian Thomas and the Spurls and those guys. He was a running back, but blew his knee out a few years in. Anyways, when I got my shot in the arena league, it was him that reached out to me like, hey, hey, little cousin, like, got this opportunity for you. But he was the director of player personnel. He put together a roster based on film that he had got and, okay, this and that. And we stepped into the arena league, and this is the highest arena league level, okay, not the NFL or CFL, whatever, but it's a high level. We went 14-4. and four. We had one of the best rosters in the league. And this is just a guy who had a passion for it because he had put together rosters on Madden and stuff, and he right. loved that part of it and watching the film and things that go into it. But – Okay, talent is talent, and he was able to get it and figure out how to make it mesh in, in the team. I mean, we had one of the best teams in the league that year, so I don't know, man. Peters can yeah. probably go. Uh, and I was, just, <laughs> I was just saying, I spent way more time in roster management mode than game mode when I played Madden back in the day. Like, absolutely. And it's, maybe it's the way certain people are, are wired. But uh, I've, I, you can tell how good of an eye I have for talent with the, the team I put together here on locked on 49ers uh let's <laughs> let's hear what wink is stinking on a little bit later we do have some twitter questions hopefully we can get to and some kyle shanahan audio but how about the get upside app 
you want to go get gas and save money doing it, it's super easy. If you're already getting gas, you're already driving around, you probably can end up going to the same gas station you already go to. Claim your up to 25 cents per gallon every time you get gas. It gets put right in your account. There's no catch with Get Upside. The cash gets put right into your account. You can cash out anytime to your bank account, uh, PayPal, e-gift card, whatever you want. It's super easy. All you got to do is download the Get Upside app and use promo code TOUCHDOWN and you can get an extra 25 cents per gallon every time you, or for the first fill up. So that's up to 50, 50 cents cash back on your very first tank and then up to 25 cents per gallon on every single tank of gas you get with the Get Upside app. Some people who drive a lot are making up to you know two three hundred dollars a month in cash back and there is no catch so just download the free get upside app use promo code touchdown to get that 50 cents per gallon on your very first tank that's promo code touchdown with the get upside app bet online would like to wish everybody a happy betting new year as we continue our march into the playoffs the the college football season is now over i think croc might have made a few dollars although you know what come to think of it we talked about maybe alabama as being the smart bet there did not turn out to be the case but bet online remains the number one spot for all the best sports wagers and action in 2022 new year new updated desktop and mobile website sign up today and receive your 50 percent welcome bonus on your very first deposit just use promo code locked on to get started 49ers cowboys easy money head on over to betonline.ag not only football we got basketball hockey boxing ufc your favorite vegas casino games don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022 at bet online the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports, bet online where the game starts. Yeah, the game started with Alabama, and I, yeah. I ended the game losing some money, man. Uh, I, what, so what, initially, what I put two hundred dollars. It was, what was, it was the line? three and a half. Alabama was plus plus three. Yeah. I didn't think either team could win by more than three the way that game was going for the most part. Nine so six thought, at the half or something. Yeah. Ugh. Oh man, Bama was plus three. I said. Oh yeah, this is is easy money. So I'm putting 200 <laughs> on it. I watched the first drive. Really, I think it was the first two drives for Bama. I mean, for Georgia. I said, huh, it's Bennett has Stetson Bennett. He has no chance. I'm putting another hundred on him. I so saw I live oh. betted. Uh, I put another hundred on oh, Alabama, no. and uh, didn't work out too well for me. He, mm. Dude, Stetson Bennett was struggling at the beginning of that game. It, it, it was he was like, oh my god, his eyes were this big. And uh, nah, they ended up pulling it out, though, man. Tough yeah. ACL tear for a guy that might have been the first wide receiver draft in yeah. the draft this year. So yeah. now he's sure going to end up a Jacksonville Jaguar with Trent Balky making the selections there. There's no <laughs> doubt in my mind on that one. Um, we got to actually wink. Let, let me let me give you the floor. What are you stinking on first before we get to Kyle Shanahan here in those Dallas Cowboys? Right. So Croc probably missed this because he was at the game and he didn't watch the broadcast. But normally – I love Troy Aikman. Like he is one of my favorite guys to listen to as he's calling a game. Well, there's a play is it, like on the Niners opening drive and Debo Samuel's running, you know, outside tackle. He's, he's about to go out of bounds and Jalen Ramsey like throws himself at him as hard as he can. And Debo just takes it, you know, just stands there. And Ramsey falls down like he's a rag doll. And Troy Aikman's like, oh, that's one great hit by Ramsey. Oh, he's such a superstar. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, he just got laid out by Debo Samuel. What? And he, like, kept harping on it, too. It's like, mm -hmm. no, you got it wrong. Yeah. You're, you're way off. Yeah, he's way I, off. It, there's I a lot of people like, please oh. don't have Aikman call the Cowboys game. And it, it's going to be Tony mm -hmm. Romo. It's the Tony Romo crew calling the, the <laughs> Another 40. Cowboy. Yeah, another I, former Cowboy. But also a former uh, Eastern Illinois quarterback like Jimmy Garoppolo. There you go. Was. All right. All right. I saw that play. And I heard the audio from Troy Aikman. And I was a little confused. Now, I will right? say this. There is there is something to a defender running at a guy full speed and stopping all of his momentum, mm -hmm. right? But he was when you down. just get, like, dipped on to where you, like, hit the ground all hard. <laughs> and, you know, it was like Ramsey, like, slammed into the ground. Yeah. And Debo's Debo just looking there. at him. Like, yeah. he's going like, to take his chain. Doing? Like, like, you know? <laughs> so... Okay, I, you could say, hey, that was a good job by Ramsey throwing his body around. He stopped Debo and made him go out of bounds. Cool. 
But when you start saying, yeah, he he comes in and he's coming in with all, and it, it's like, well, he, he didn't mm. really, he didn't affect Debo to any extent. No. I mean, Debo literally ran ran through him. It looked like Ramsey might have got a concussion as hard as yeah. he hit the ground. <laughs> he pops up chirping, and Debo's like, what? What, but why? what are yeah. we doing here? <laughs> I love that play so much. I mean, it was effective. Like he stopped, he got the tackle. Sure. The play was over. Yeah. There was like four so, guys around him. Great Ramsey for that. But Debo got the best of that hit. There's yeah. that's clear. But what the funny part was after that hit, Debo wanted to flex and he looked around, and I think that was at the Rams sideline too. So he looked at Ramsey, looked at the Rams sideline. He didn't want to get a taunting penalty. So he looked Smart. around, didn't know what to do. He just turned around and walked back to the huddle and just gave like a little bit of a flex on his way yeah, back. A bit like, <laughs> the reaction on that was hilarious. That was one of the notes that, that I didn't get to yesterday, by the way, Croc, was re-watching that game. I think Debo Samuel got tackled one time because there was another play where someone tried to hit him. He did the same thing. He stoned him. He Threw didn't go down. down. Um, he, he, on the, on the touchdown was the first time he actually hit the, the, the rushing touchdown. He hit the ground cause he was trying to get the pylon, but it wasn't like he was knocked to the ground. Right. Yeah. So that was the first time Debo Samuel touched the ground in the entire game. Uh, I think there was like one catch over the middle where he actually got tackled and that's it. That's wild. Like, he got tackled on the big game. Um, right before the touchdown, uh, to tie the game, oh, the catch. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Yeah. but yeah. he was like, I mean, he made guys miss and he's dragging the guy. They're pulling yeah. on his jersey, his shirt mm -hmm. and. He, he's Debo. He's a special player, and for whatever reason, it's not being acknowledged how much of a special season he had. He had almost nineteen hundred yards. Yeah, as yeah, as a receiver, yards from scrimmage, uh, just yeah. behind up and Jonathan Taylor. That's it. Actually, it's a perfect segue. Fourteen uh, touchdowns. Like yeah. that is Wild. a tremendous season. Fifteen, if you count his touchdown pass, right? Right. Um. So uh, Kyle Shanahan was asked about Debo and because they had him at the Senior Bowl that year when they drafted him in 2019. And he was asked if he saw those qualities and, and realized he was going to be such a versatile player that could even actually play running back in the NFL. Here was Kyle Shanahan's answer. No, not no, really. I mean, that's um, what it gets because I would like to say we did, but it was part of trying at running back there. And we never really saw him on college. We just we knew going into that draft we had to get a receiver and made the decision to not go the free agent route. Um, and – and we spent our money in some other places and we knew we had to go get a receiver. And, you know, just looking at the group that we had um, at the time, we, we thought it was so important regardless of what type of receiver we added, we had to add a physical, physical guy, um, a guy who could kind of um, intimidate guys, which is how he played with his size, breaking tackles, things like that. Um, and that's really why, that's why we really liked Debo. Um, whatever his pluses and minuses were, we knew that he was a physical guy and that's what we knew we had to, needed to add to our group and um to adam he was that from the beginning and we just found out more about him as we went and to be able to use his physicality as a receiver has been huge but and now that we've been able to add the running back part just makes it so much easier to get the ball in his hands so my mind my mind obviously went back to the draft and i was thinking about 2019 and i was like okay physical they were looking for physical wide receivers jalen Hurd also he was the versatile guy that could have played some running back but also looking for physicality. That was clearly what the 49ers were looking for in that draft, of wide receiver. They went back-to-back, -back, second, third round, wide receiver. DK Metcalf, very physical. I wonder if he was on their board. I wonder if he would have mm -hmm. been selected. I wonder if he's the next guy on their board after Debo Samuel, but he doesn't really fit the style for Kyle Shanahan. I always got the feeling that DK wasn't really their style of guy, and I wonder if they would have actually even taken Jalen Hurd if DK Metcalf was still on the board there at the top of the third round because he only went three picks in front of um, – Jalen Hurd, but A.J. Brown is the one. I bet if Debo Samuel wasn't in the draft, A.J. Brown would have been that pick for the 49ers at the top of the second round because another physical guy there, and clearly that's what they were looking for. Hmm. Well, the way everybody made it seem, and there's two things I took away from the audio. One, the the way people were talking about it, maybe this was a, oh, it's Mac Jones at three type thing, but it was almost a foregone conclusion that Nikhil Harry was going to be the pick, and that's what everybody was saying. And I was like, please don't. He wasn't even in my top five. I battled with my top guys with Debo, DK, and AJ Brown. I'm like, any of these three guys, I settled in on uh, DK, number one, Debo, number two, and AJ, three. But it could have been either way there. They like Nikhil Harry, though. And I was like, gosh, clearly he hasn't lived up to whatever. And maybe it's, mm -mm. maybe it's, it's, it's the Patriots. And I, and I heard Cam Newton talk about it the Patriot way and how. It's hard sometimes for young guys to come in and and be able to fit into like just be able to play 
as well as they can in that culture. So we'll see. Sure. But the other thing I took away from that was every opportunity Kyle Shanahan gets to to say um, he, he does. I mean, there, there's times where it's not even it doesn't even fit in at that time, and you still use it. Put it in, yeah. It's almost like a like somebody's pressing the button and just adding it in there because it's so quick sometimes. <laughs> no, that's instead of a the, cough um, button, there's an um button. Um, when I saw the when I saw the lights, I, I went over there and um and then I grabbed this spoon um <laughs> this uh, water bottle right here um and I'm like golly like how many times is this guy gonna say um? He makes you want to say um when you're listening to him because. It like gets in your own head, and then you want to start saying um back. Mm -hmm. Um, it's yeah, I just did it, and um, <laughs> it's funny because uh, the 49ers might have gotten saved by the Patriots taking the kill Harry at the end of the first round because yeah. there's there were there was reports, and I don't know how true all this is that maybe that he was the guy that would have been the number one on their board at the top of the second round, and luckily they did get Debo Samuel. How about the Dallas Cowboys? I mean, this is back Ooh. to childhood. Like this is this is where it's at. When I was growing up in the 90s, this was 49ers Cowboys. That was it. You hated the Cowboys more than the Rams, more than the Seahawks. Mm -hmm. Like nobody hated the Seahawks. They were in the AFC West. Who cares? Like I liked the Seahawks, actually. They had these, you know, funny uniforms and Steve Largent, and like they were bad forever. It's like, why would you hate the Seahawks, right? Maybe you hated the Raiders, but it was Cowboys one, Raiders two, then maybe start talking about like the Falcons, Nerdy Bird, and and the Rams and some of those teams. But the 49ers were better than the division so much that uh, I don't, none of the division opponents for the 49ers growing up felt like that big of a rival because the 49ers dominated my entire life through the 90s, the, the the division. It was the Cowboys. Cowboys and Packers, those 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 uh, playoff matchups. And Kyle Shanahan was asked about that because he grew up with the same teams and then, uh, again, had similar stuff going on when, he was, when his dad was coaching the Denver Broncos. So this was his answer asked about that rivalry of Cowboys 49ers. Oh, I think that's as cool as it gets because that's the coolest part of my childhood growing up, I feel like. I mean, my senior year in high school, my dad was with the Broncos and we were there able to beat the Packers in the Super Bowl, which was unbelievable. But before that, it was 7th grade, 8th grade, ninth grade, 92, 93, 94. Every single year, I thought we were the best team in the league. I think it was 14, 14 and 2. Steve Young wins the championship and we played Dallas, who I think was 10 and 6 or 11 and 5. And I remember being on that sideline and just watching how good the Cowboys were, and it was unbelievable. And next year, going to Dallas for the home field advantage, and um, we all know what happened there. That one wasn't even close. Um, and then the third year, you know, in free agency, they got Ken Norton. They had a Dion week three. Um, and then they had that game at home where Eric Davis started it off, I think, with a pick six. They had Dion fall around Alvin Harper. Because um, he had hurt the Niners in those two years previously, uh, Michael Irvin went off, um, but they limited Alvin Harper, which was good. And Eric Davis made those plays and made a little comeback at the end. I think there was a fumble in the opening kickoff or something. But I mean, as you can tell, those games I still remember them, and I've never watched them. Those are just those are part of my childhood. That was such cool football because everyone knew those three NFC championships. Those three years were the Super Bowl. And he was on the sideline for these games. I mean, that's yeah. what's kind of crazy, right? Yeah. Well, that's, that's how crazy. we all view it. And when you think of that rivalry, we were all young during that time, but that's what we grew up watching. So I know mm -hmm. a lot of people will say 49ers Cowboys, that's not a rivalry, but it is within because we grew up in that era. We were coming up in that era. My brother, he's a diehard Dallas, Dallas Cowboy fan. We're actually going to the game together this weekend nice. to, to watch it. And it's it's personal between he and I. It's personal just between what it was when we were growing up. I feel like every time after that, it's always – I mean, even with C.J. Beathard starting against the Cowboys, it's like, oh, just beat the Cowboys. I don't care if you do anything else this year, beat the Cowboys. When it was C.J. Beathard, like, just please beat them. When it was Nick Mullins last year, it was like, I want the 49ers <laughs> to lose. I was on here talking about it, like, 49ers don't, don't need to win. 49ers don't need to win. I was talking about that on every podcast. But – you got to beat Dallas. I don't care if Nick Mullins, I don't care who it is at quarterback, beat Dallas because I can't stand them. And uh, 49ers have another opportunity this year. Yep, it's it, it runs deep. And I put a poll on Twitter just to ask, since the Niners had just played the Rams and had the Cowboys coming up, uh, I there are seven, four, 741 votes. I asked, which rival do you hate the most? And I purposely left out other teams, just Rams or Cowboys, and it was – um, 66%, so two-thirds Cowboys, 
and only one third Rams. And so that the, the Niners have not had important games or hardly played the Cowboys at all in like 20 years. So that's how important those games were in the 90s to a lot of 49ers fans. Still, young fans probably don't remember. They weren't even alive at that point. And Kyle Shanahan actually after that, there was a follow up question and he was asked if the, the players in the locker room felt the same way. And he's like, oh, they don't get it at all. Like they weren't even yeah. alive. <laughs> they weren't alive then. And they weren't Niners fans even since then, you know, until they became 49ers, you know, they grew up in other places and, and fans of other teams growing up. So the Niners players don't understand it, but, um, and, uh, I, I left out the Seahawks purposely, but Seahawks was the most common thing that people wrote in like Seahawks. But like, yeah, but I left them out. So Cowboys, people are probably the Cowboys. younger 25, yeah. you know, 20 to 30 years old. And I get because it. I'm, even at my age at 34, I'm at the, you know, I was young enough to remember that, but, like at 34, I'm you know, I'm at the kind of the end of that, like the glory days of that, right? That, that, that rivalry, you know. So, anybody younger than me, I don't think you expect them to truly no. understand the, the, the hatred and how deep it runs, and how those were the two teams, like Kyle Shanahan said, that was the Super Bowl every yeah. year. That NFC Championship yeah. game you was knew. the Super Bowl, and yeah. if it weren't for Dallas, the 49ers would have maybe eight Super Bowl rings right now instead of five. Right, if it wasn't for Emmett Smith and Troy Aikman and Michael Irvin and yeah, all those guys, I'm in my early 40s, so yeah, I hate the Seahawks, but there's just something deep inside. There is just a hatred of the Cowboys that I don't think will ever be surpassed because, like you said, that was the foundation, you know, of my of my football, you know, childhood and and really falling in love with the game was was winning, winning, and then a lot of losing to the Cowboys, and that was not fun. Yeah, same here. I mean, like Wink and I are same age as, as Kyle Shanahan, basically. He was like junior high and then, you know, high school. And that, yep. those were the, the biggest games and the biggest – they were the Super Bowl. The NFC Championship was the Super Bowl for a long time in the NFL. And those are – they still – they you still feel it. And that's why it's hard for me to even – give Deion Sanders as much props because then he was on the Cowboys and was like, hi, I don't like Deion. I didn't like Deion every year of his career except for one. You know what I mean? Like, I, uh, I hated Deion, Cowboy, Cowboys Deion <laughs> so much. And so, um, like, when I list 49ers, great 49ers, like, oh, he's a one-and-done guy. They won a Super Bowl, helped him get over the hump which was part of that too. And then like the salary cap arrows is very different there too. Like these teams could stack and stack and they were powerhouse. It, it's a, uh, it's a rivalry that will never end. Even if the 49ers and Cowboys don't have another important game for 20 more years. So that's, that's where we're at. That's how important those nineties games were for the youngsters who weren't around for those and don't remember them. I feel sorry for you because it was a different time. And I can only imagine what those era, that era would look like on Twitter, Steve Young and Joe Montana, that debate on Twitter. Holy crap. You think, mm you think Trey Lance and Jimmy Garoppolo is bad? That would have been 10 times worse. Are you kidding me? Two Hall of Fame quarterbacks on the same roster trying to figure out who should play uh, for a Super Bowl team. Cowboys 49ers, Packers 49ers. Uh, that would have been that would have been wild on social media. Guys, we got to get out of here. Wink, as always, appreciate you jumping on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for making us your first listen, by the way, everybody out there. For your second listen, you can find me doing the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. You can find Croc doing the Locked On NFL draft. Your boy Q doing Locked On bets, talking about everything going on in the sports betting world. All right here for free on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Croc and I back tomorrow with the hosts of Locked On Cowboys. We're doing the Thursday crossover right here. Locked On 49ers. See you.